Jason Paolo. How's everyone doing today? It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here. I, I'm so excited to come to Sao Paulo, to come to Brazil, to be able to present to all of you. Um, I myself am an organizer. I organize DevOps Days Philadelphia. And when I think of DevOps, I think of community. And in 2018, DevOps Days has approximately 70 conferences around the world in different cities. Um, and I can't think of any other group of individuals that have the same reach as DevOps Days. So for all of you who are in attendance, um, thank you for attending, thank you for being part of the community. This is really what makes everything special. Um, today I'm coming here to speak to you about risk and reliability. My talk is titled Reliability Theater, uh, When Things Break uh, and Why Managing Risk is Important. Uh, my name is Peter Shannon, again, and this is my contact information, so, is that better? Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, so, Peter J. Shan is basically my handle across the board. Uh, if you want to talk to me on Twitter, uh, reach me on LinkedIn. I have a website that really needs to be updated, but, you know, whatever. Uh, and it's peterjshan at gmail.com as well. Um, I'm not super active on Twitter, but feel free to send me an email or uh, you know direct message or whatever, and I, I, I will respond to you. I also work at Instacart. Um, who here has heard of Instacart? One person? Okay. It's not terribly surprising. We're not, we're not in Latin America yet, but um, basically Instacart delivers groceries to your door. So instead of going to the grocery store, you will pick out the items that you want, and then a shopper, similar to Uber, part of the gig economy, will go out, pick up the items, and bring it to your door. Um, and I'm also the lead organizer for DevOps Days Philadelphia. Here's a few spoilers for the talk. So what I, I hope everyone can get out of this talk um, is a greater understanding of risk, reliability, and availability, how these things are connected, and how they're different. Um, I'd like for people to understand uh, also practical ways to evaluate this. The talk is titled Reliability Theater, and when I first put these words into Google, nothing came up. And it came from security theater. Perhaps you've heard of it. Has anyone here heard of security theater? A few folks? So, in 2003, uh, Bruce Schneier coined the term security theater in direct result of the TSA. Now, I'm not sure how many folks here are familiar with the TSA, but I am intimately familiar with the TSA. Very recently, I had to stand in line at the airport, have all my bags checked, right? Have to take off my shoes, my belt, you know, the whole nine yards, right? And statistically, this hasn't made us more secure, right? People have done studies on this, it hasn't made us more secure. And security theater is the illusion of security, right? So you lock your door at night, but a determined enough individual can kick your door down, but we feel more secure because we've locked it. And this is where reliability theater comes from, right? We do things to make ourselves feel more reliable, but are we? So reliability theater, my definition, and I'll read it here, is the practice of investing in countermeasures intended to provide the feeling of improved reliability while doing little or nothing to achieve it. It's the illusion of reliability. And another way I like to think of it is solving the wrong problem. And I'll explain why I think another way to think of this is solving the wrong problem. Reliability is the probability that you will get correct outputs from your service, right? So you have a service, you want it to return 200 okay. And if it doesn't, then it's not reliable, right? 
We want it to return the correct <laughs> outputs. And reliability and availability are not the same, but they are similar. And they get conflated quite a bit. In fact, a lot of times you'll hear, hear people talk about availability and reliability in the same context. Available means operational. Reliable means correct. And what's really interesting about this too is when you think about this from the standpoint of a customer versus a practitioner, right? So I'm a customer, right? I could be a customer of, I know you don't pay Facebook, right? But just let's use that as an example. I'm a customer of Facebook, I use their service, right? You log in and you get a 500. You're not happy, right? The service isn't reliable and it's not available. And that's what you think as a customer. But as a practitioner, what do you think? You see a 500, this is evidence, right? Oh, the service is up, but why is it returning a 500? You don't think about the service being unavailable. Sure, it's unavailable to your customers, but it's technically available. It's up, it's serving traffic, but it's not serving traffic correctly. And this is why these two words tend to get inflated or mixed up. So here's a trivial example of reliability. Um, we have an application that is unreliable, right? So we built a service. It works, let's say, most of the time. Maybe it's good enough, right? And we're sitting in a meeting and we're deciding, okay, um, you know, do we want to tackle some of our technical debt? Do we want to smash some bugs? Do we want to fix this service, make it more reliable? Or do we want to go multi-region, right? Multi-region sounds like a really great thing. So in this case, we are prioritizing availability over reliability. But if you don't think about it as separate contexts, you might actually think, this is making my service better. I'm making my service more available. It's going to be better and people are going to, you know, people are going to have lower latencies in the other region. But the problem is, if your service doesn't work in one region, why would it work in two? Right? So this is why reliability is so critical. And this is why it's critical to understand the difference between reliability and availability. And risk comes into this. Risk comes into this as a, as, a, uh, uh, as a big component. And I'm making the argument that risk, reliability, and availability all share sort of a, a similar related context. Available equals operational. Reliable equals correct. And risk equals a random force. Why random force? Because you can't control risk, right? You can control the components that risk is comprised of, which is impact and probability, but you can't control risk, right? So let's talk about risk. When most folks think of risk, this is what I think they think of. An extreme sport, bungee jumping, something that might scare you. Right? But what does risk look like to us in our day to day? This is what risk looks like to us. Risk looks like merging the wrong PR. Risk looks like pushing out code that hasn't been tested. Right? Risk looks like fat fingering commands and taking down this thing. These things happen, they happen every day. And so when we're sitting at our computer, we have to be able to evaluate this. Warren Buffett says risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. And for those of you who know Warren Buffett, he's a you know, very successful uh, uh, investor. And so not knowing what you're doing is strictly coming from the financial sector. But this also translates into technology, right? Do you know what you're doing, right? When you receive a pull request from somebody and you're not familiar with this piece of the code, do you know what you're doing? Should you be the person to review this code? Do you understand the ramifications of clicking approve? Oftentimes people think of risk as a matrix. Um, and risk can actually be quite complicated. So the matrix is fairly self-explanatory, right? On one axis, we have impact. On the other axis, we have uh, likelihood. So
So if you're trying to evaluate where is the best place to fix your application, what are the best risks to tackle, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the red or the green? Anyway. Red. Red. Right. We want to we want to tackle the highest impact risks that are the most likely to happen. Right? The other risks, the ones that are very unlikely, right? Possibly that are extremely impactful too, which would be in the far lower right corner. This is like AWS disappearing overnight, right? <laughs> it would be terrible for for you know thousands of businesses. Is it likely? Not so much. So risk is comprised of probability and impact, right? We can't control risk directly, but we can cause it to go up and down by controlling probability and impact. And what's important to understand is if you don't know what the hazards are, you can't avoid them, right? And this is being able to qualify your risk, being able to sit down with your peers and come up with a list of your risks. Do you even know what your risks are? Right? It's something to think about. And again, as stated, risk can go up and down. It's not controllable directly. And it's a random force. Probability is controllable. You can control the likelihood of an event. And you can do this by modifying your application. Right? You can make your application more reliable. You can increase the availability. Doing these things can, you can, you can be in two different cloud providers. You can go to Google and AWS, right? You can reduce the likelihood of an event. And this is what is known as quantifying, right? So we quantify the likelihood, and we quantify the likelihood by evaluating what that probability is. And then impact, right? Impact, again, we can control a little bit. We can decide what the impact to our service is, and we qualify impact. So and this is really important because Folks here don't all work at the same company, right? So your, your impact or, you know, versus your impact and so forth are all different, right? Um, I used to work at Warner Brothers and we delivered video, right? And so impact for us was, you know, of course you could say the services, right? Like, uh, but but there, was, there was a wide variety. It was not just the service was down, but we're not streaming videos. Okay, the website's up, but we're not streaming videos. Well, people can read comic books, but they can't watch videos. So the impact changes based on the service. And sometimes, if you have a very complex service, um, like your Facebooks, like your Ubers, that are comprised of hundreds of microservices, your impact is probably very diverse because certain services might be down that your customers don't even notice. Maybe they're internal, right? They're internal services that customers won't notice. So the impact is less. Whereas everybody would recognize if you pull out your phone and you can't get a vehicle in Uber because the service is down, right? So impact has context. Now there are different ways that we can mitigate this, right? So we have chance reduction strategies. This is ways that we can reduce our probability. And we have impact reduction strategies, ways that we can reduce our impact. Um, and let's just take uh, an arbitrary example here. So. Uh, we're going to say, uh, we, we have an application that's, uh, uh, you know, what is the risk for delivering incorrect responses um, and not being available to the customer? Um, the resulting impact is revenue loss, right? So we have an application. It's in one availability zone. Okay, so we're in US East 1, we're in one availability zone. And a key point here is the application always returns 200 OK. That's all the application does. And our customers love that because they love when the application works. So it's 100% reliable all the time. So what we can do to make this application less, you know, uh, 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 lower the risk is to add an extra availability zone. It's a very simple thing. What we've done is we've increased our availability, right? Now we haven't actually done anything to our reliability because we know the service always returns 200 OK. But if the service is now more available, Right? The imp our, our impact goes down and the probability goes down because what we've done is we've said now if we lose one availability zone, we have a second. Right? We've made our service more reliable. And we can do this again. We can go multi-region. Right? 
We can go multi-region and now we're even more available. Now we can lose an entire region and still serve traffic to our customers. But the application, the reliability hasn't changed. It's still a 100% reliable application. And now here, the main difference is, and I don't know, perhaps this is too slow to see, but now the application returns 200 OK 90% of the time. So despite all of our efforts to be available, now our application is less reliable and our risk goes up. And this is one of the key points I'm trying to make about understanding the difference between reliability and availability. You could be the most reliable service in the world. You could have your service spread across every Amazon availability zone there is. But if you're not testing your code, if your code is not returning the correct responses that you intended to, and you do this through testing, through you know, reviewing PRs, um, then your service is going to have risk. It's going to be unreliable, and there's nothing you can do. What you're doing is you're making a very unreliable service incredibly available. And this question always comes up. Should we plan for catastrophic events, right? So this is your AWS version. This is a meteor crashed into the Earth. And I always say, you know, if an asteroid actually or a meteor crashed into the Earth, the last thing you'd probably be caring about is your job, right? Like, oh no, you know, got to get to my computer. But in the event that AWS has a, a serious outage, the likelihood is so low, and you would be among You'd be among company, right? There would be tons of other companies that are, that are suffering the same fate as you. And that comes back to the matrix, right? We talked about this earlier. Um, high impact, very unlikely. It's not something, it's, it's not something that you really need to worry about. So let's take an example from the movies. Do I have Star Wars fans here? Okay, that was a lot. All right. So, if anything here is factually incorrect, I don't want to hear about it, all right? Because <laughs> I, so just to let you know, when I started this, when I was demoing this talk, I had, I had a picture of the Death Star from, I think, the Empire Strikes Back, and oh, did I hear about it. So, and you'll, you'll see why, because I mixed up the, the images from the movies. So what is the probability something will go wrong, right? The Empire has built this Death Star. And they're sitting around the table uh, at lunch or whatever, and they're, the engineers are talking. What's the probability something will go wrong at our desk? <laughs> and so, of course, the thermal exhaust port comes up, right? The Death Star is indestructible. We know this. We built it that way. But we do have this thermal exhaust port. So how do we inform or quantify our decision making for the thermal exhaust port? Now, as engineers, there's probably a lot of ways to use observability really dig in and figure this out. I decided to apply some nerd math. And again, I don't know how factually correct this is. So give me a break. Um, <laughs> roughly, we have the surface area of the Death Star and the surface area of our thermal exhaust port. And the probability that someone would just, I don't know, throw a bomb arbitrarily and it would land in the thermal exhaust port is very, very low, right? So this falls into that sort of very unlikely catastrophic event. All right, so we can apply our formula to this, right? Um, our impact would be the highest that it can be, right? Because what happens, we lose our death star, and we, we love our death star. Um, so how do we plan to avoid risk, right? And we can do things. How do we, how do we reduce our risk? So what did they do, right? We've all, most of us have seen the movie. Well, we install some lasers, right? That'll stop people from, from throwing bombs in our exhaust port. Get a whole bunch of TIE fighters, right? This is great. Like, we'll just protect it. Nobody will get close. And my favorite is the coffee lid. We should do a giant <laughs> coffee lid on the exhaust port because this surely would have solved the problem, right? But we know what happened in the end, right? Now, I know this is the opposite of what I was saying, the point I was making about the asteroid, right? We don't really need to worry about the asteroid running into the, you know, smashing into the Earth. And so we can make the argument, the Empire didn't really need to worry about their, you know, their Death Star <coughs> exploding. But, you know, Luke had the Force and it was with him and, you know, it's magic. And so these things happen in the magic, you know, you know like magical universes, right? 
But the point is, is things are going to break, and you're going to be really sad about them. And there's nothing you can do. Things will always break, right? You can build a very uh, available service. You can build a very reliable service, and things are still going to break. You know, somebody's still going to merge that pull request that they shouldn't have. Uh, an availability zone will go down. Your application might not be able to handle its upstream services very well. These things happen. And the good news is, for the Star Wars universe, this was all done in a, in a movie, uh, in a you know, warehouse somewhere, and the props still exist, and everything is fine, right? So let's, let's talk about the real empire, right? Let's talk about the real life stuff. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, who uses AWS? Okay, quite a few. Google, Google Cloud? Okay. Azure? It's a good mix, good. I'm not surprised, most people still use AWS. So, here's the problem. AWS has incidents all the time, right? Now, I don't know which regions these were in, but they have incidents all the time. Um, in fact, it was about two weeks ago, at Instacart, we lost an availability zone. And this was a fun one, too. Um, what was this, 2013? 2017. I don't know, does anyone remember this? This, this happened in US East, so I don't know. But somebody accidentally fat-fingered a command and took down S3. Well, I should say, they didn't take down S3 through the command. They caused a problem in which they needed to reboot S3. And S3 apparently takes four hours to reboot. Um, and at the time, I was at a startup called Drama Fever, and our service was down for four hours. And there were a lot of companies that had the same, same issue. And this is where our service level agreements come to play, right? Who knows about service level agreements? I know our vendors know. So these are the agreements that we make with our upstream providers, our SaaS providers, um, that tell us how available they are claiming to be. And if they don't meet that, then we get some sort of compensation, right? And it's usually compensation of just whatever time we lost. Unfortunately, it's not, a, not any financial loss. Um, and from the SRE book, we can actually look at how availability is calculated in a few different ways, right? So we have our time-based availability, right? And with this, what this tells us is how many minutes are we allowed to be down? So this is our availability. And we can, we can retune that equation to figure out, this will answer that, to give us the downtime. The other equation for availability is our aggregate. And what aggregate tells us is how many bad requests are we allowed to serve? This is our reliability, right? Because remember, a service can be down or you could be getting bad requests. And often, remember, as a customer, and as when we use AWS, we're the customers, we typically don't care, right? We're getting 500 from our service. Well, our application didn't know how to handle that, so we crashed too. Or your application is, is completely down, and we're just getting time out to cross the board, right? So as a customer, whether the service is not reliable or available, tend to be smushed together. But SLAs will typically separate out these two components. So I want to play a little game. It's called Guess the SLA. And I'm really curious to see how many people can get some of these. So what is the SLA for S3 in nines? So who thinks it's two nines? Four? Three nines? Folks think it's more than three? Four nines? People think it's four nines? Okay. It's three. S3 has an SLA of three nines. But I find this really curious because I remember when AWS was early and people always talked about how rock solid S3 was. And I remember hearing the phrase nine nines. It's insane. Nine nines? We can be down for like half a second every month or something. <laughs> So S3 is allowed to be unavailable for 43, whatever, almost 44 minutes per month. 
and they're allowed to serve you a thousand bad requests per hundred million. EC2, three nines, four nines, what do you guys think? Four? Four? Okay. It's four nines. EC2 is four nines. It's more reliable, more available than S3. At least as per the SLA. I mean, you can see that uh, EC2 can be down for 4.38 minutes per month. And it's sort of a weird thing to think about because when you're running uh, a virtual server, like what is down for EC2, right? Does that mean you can't spin new ones up? Does it mean they can't move around availability zones? So I'm not entirely clear what that means, but that's their SLA. Now this one's really good. How many, how many nines for Route 53? Four, five? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 100. What'd you say? 100. <laughs> you got it. AWS claims 100% uptime, which we all know is not real, right? You can't, you can't. But they do. So they say that they're always going to be available, they're always going to be reliable for Route 53. And the important point here is to know the SLA for your upstream services. Because you have to make decisions about your architecture. You have to decide why, you have to decide which services you want to put in your upstreams. Because ultimately, their reliability, their availability will become part of your availability, your reliability. Um, and this, this comes back to the common phrase that nobody ever got fired for choosing AWS, right? Um, and perhaps that's true. So let's talk a little bit about money. Right? Let's talk about risk, reliability, availability, and cost. <coughs> Who here knows what an hour of downtime costs? Does anyone know what an hour of downtime costs their, their organization? One person. Two? Three? Okay. It's a tough question. A lot of times people who own their own company, CEOs, <coughs> CEOs, they don't know what an hour of downtime costs them. Because it's complicated, right? <coughs> The SRE book, and I'm going to get a little closer so I can read this part. The SRE book has uh, some really interesting things to say about this. Um, and I'll read just a, a subset of this. So, we strive to make a service reliable enough, but no more reliable than it needs to be. And the part about being no more reliable than it needs to be is really interesting. Because oftentimes, when architecting solutions to problems, you might fall into the trap of pre-optimization, right? You want to solve every problem. You want this application to be rock solid. Never go down. But what Google's saying is, let's not set the goalpost to infinity. Let's set the goalpost here, right? This is how available we want it to be. And there are reasons they do that. I mean, obviously, they're huge, right? Not every company has gotten to that scale. But it's an interesting concept to think about that when they develop their applications, they already think about, this is how reliable we want it to be. This is how available we need this service to be. We don't need to be more than that. That's enough. And so one of the examples they use is uh, cell phones, right? A user on a 99% reliable smartphone cannot tell the difference between four nines and five nines of reliability. So your phone's the bottom. <coughs> Right? Why build a service? Why build a service that's super reliable? Why spend the money? Right? Managing service reliable uh, reliability is largely about managing risk, and managing risk can be costly. So here's the exponential growth chart. Right? Cost. Getting from one nine to two nines in availability probably won't cost you that. In fact, getting from two nines to three nines might not even cost you that much. But when you start getting into the four nines, the five nines, the six nines, now we're talking a lot of money. Right? We're, talking, uh, we're talking resources, right? computational resources, redundant compute machine resources. We're talking opportunity costs. What are the costs of your time? 
You have to hire developers. You have to hire more developers. You have to pay them. Right? All of that costs. And so ultimately, what this comes down to is you have to balance between tackling bugs, tackling technical debt, and shipping features. Right? Who does this? Who has these, who has these conversations at work? Fixing technical debt, shipping features. Right? It's a very, it's a very common issue. And depending on the reliability of your service, there's, there's always a threshold, right? So, you know, executives might want chip features, 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 features. But then suddenly, your application becomes unreliable. You're getting bad feedback. You're getting bad reviews. Now it's, whoa, 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 breaks. Let's start fixing things, all right? Code orange, code yellow, whatever you want to call it. We need to start fixing our application. Then once your application gets its reliability back to a certain point, you're back to shipping features, right? And so now I want to talk about some more deeper concepts, right? And that's where that's where our friend the philosopher comes in. You have to ponder these things. So if you don't know the hazards, how can you avoid or identify? And this comes back to, to risk, managing risk, and, and understanding um, understanding how you need to evaluate this as a team, right? If you don't know the hazards, how can you avoid them? So when you have your application, can you sit down with your peers? Can you make a list of what your risks are? Is it your upstream providers? Are they not reliable? Um, are, you in a, are you in a colo? Uh, you know, are you not in the cloud provider? Are, are you co-located and there's risk potentially in that? Um, do you have protection against a DDoS attack, right? There's, there's a wide variety of different risks that could encroach on your application. And making a list of these is the first step. Because once you've identified them, you can then evaluate <coughs> where these risks fall as far as probability, right? How probable is each risk? And then you can evaluate the impact. <coughs> is this risk business ending? If it's business ending, then it might be something that you need to address sooner rather than later. Identify risks and practice hazard recognition. So hazard recognition is really interesting too, right? We all possess this ability. So when you're walking down the street, you know whether it's safe to cross or not, right? You see a car coming, stop, right? When the car goes by, then you cross. How do we, how do we practice hazard recognition in engineering? How do we practice hazard recognition in our day-to-day -day job? And a lot of this, I think, comes down to understanding the code base and understanding your own limitations. Right? Are you able to look at a piece of code and see if there's an issue? Are you the right person to evaluate that piece of code? <coughs> we can make this easier through observability, right? What is observability? Logs, metrics, right? So I'm sure most people here have heard of uh, Graphite, Grafana, Datadog, Logly. I mean, yeah, I mean, you name it, there's, there's a ton of providers out there. Um, APM. Hooking these services up to your application give you eyes on what's going on, right? Because especially when you start to scale, you can't just go into your application and you know, run S-Trace across your service. You can't do that. But using APM, using services like Datadog, being able to evaluate your logs, being able to pull metrics out of your application, this is where you get your observability. This is where you're able to take that information, quantify it, and start making important decisions. And evaluating risk, right? And this is asking yourself, am I competent 
am I competent to evaluate the situation? So competency is a really interesting idea to think about, right? And I don't mean this as, you know, like, are you incompetent, right? I mean this as competency, do you have the competency to evaluate the risk? So think about this. You get woken up in the middle of the night, it's two in the morning, three in the morning, and it's a problem with the database, right? So you're a back-end engineer, you work with the database, but you don't actually administer the database, right? You don't know which metrics to look at, you just notice there's high latency. And so what do you do? Do you try and make a decision about what the best action is for the database? Maybe this is something you've seen before. Maybe you know, okay, we need to make a small modification on the application. Maybe we need to um, you know, scale in, right? Maybe there's too many connections on the database and that's why we have a latency issue. But maybe it's something that you don't understand. Are you competent to understand the situation? Are you the right person? Should you wake somebody else up? And oftentimes, in operations, this comes down to culture, right? So do you have a culture where waking up somebody is okay, right? I've been in places where being on call is hard and people don't want to do it. And so when you're waking somebody up, you're giving them like the worst news of their life, right? It's two in the morning, they're like, ah, oh, I just don't want to deal with this right now. But a lot of that has to do with building culture, right? Building your culture in such a way that folks are not burnt out, that there's enough time in between rotations, and then making sure that people are aware that there are subject matter experts, right? SMEs. And so, and those subject matter experts, they understand that if the database goes down, I'm the subject matter expert in the database. Somebody's going to wake me up, and that's okay. Or, you know, uh, our Elasticsearch cluster's having issues. I'm the subject matter, subject matter expert in Elasticsearch. And so I know I'm going to be woken up, right? And it's really important because doing this, right, these are some of the more organizational, social things that you can do to lessen your impact. Why? Because you're putting the best people, <coughs> you're putting the best people, the right people for the task to solve the problem. And I'm going to conclude with this. So. I have a colleague who worked for uh, one of the US government agencies uh, launching satellites, um, uh, launching rovers, and these types of things uh, into space. And uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing here. I don't know if, I, if I'm getting the story completely correct. But um, there was uh, a rover, I believe, called Discovery. And one of the issues they had was uh, there was a terrible malfunction that could have been avoided if an engineer had simply communicated that information. Right, so communication is one of the most powerful tools we have to help mitigate risk. And I don't think we do enough of it. <coughs> but again, it's cultural, right? So if you know something's wrong, say something, right? If you feel like you're not the best person to tackle a project, or to tackle an incident. Don't feel bad about asking for help, right? It's about communicating. And if you see something that could potentially be harmful to your service, um, to your availability, raise it up. Bring it up at your, next, uh, at your next scrum, or your sum, or however your team chooses to communicate, right? Because what you might not realize is you might be looking at the tip of an iceberg of something much greater, right, that nobody else knows. And a lot of this comes down to don't feel, don't feel bad to ask silly questions, right? And that's, that's a good thing to think about. Do you, feel, do you feel weird asking silly questions with your peers, right? Because you should. Because that's how, that's how you discover things. That's how you discover um, you know, so-and-so is looking at this one piece of the application. It's behaving really odd. But it's not odd enough that it feels like an incident. Well, it might turn out that it's a really big deal. And this is where communication is extremely important. And this goes up and down the food chain, too. Communication between 
Upper management and engineers is also critical. It is a challenge. So with that, the last thing I have to say is, things will break, and you are going to be <coughs> sad about it. But just remember, there are ways to mitigate risk. You have to communicate effectively. Try to work on your hazard recognition as a team. Try to evaluate what your risks are for your service. And talk about these things, because they're really important. And if you talk about them enough, they're going to become ingrained. And people are going to feel more confident about communicating and bringing these issues up. Thank you very much.